Hi guys, my name is Trevor Sullivan and welcome to another CBT Nuggets skill on Kubernetes. Now, in order to understand how Kubernetes works from a DNS perspective, we are going to be exploring the core DNS project. Now, to give you a little brief backstory, in earlier versions of Kubernetes, the default DNS server that was deployed into the cluster was known as kubedns. And kubedns has since been replaced by another default DNS server component, and that is the core DNS open source project. So Core DNS is an open source project of its own that is supported by some companies out there in the networking space, such as Infoblox. I know that they have employees that are contributing to this particular project. And Core DNS basically runs as a couple of pods on your Kubernetes cluster, and it allows your application pods to resolve DNS from the Kubernetes cluster network. Now, your pods are going to oftentimes need to be able to resolve external names outside of the cluster. So think about you know, hitting google.com or github.com or anything like that. Those external DNS names need to be resolvable by your application pods in most cases, especially if you're dependent on external SaaS APIs, for example. However, your pods are also going to need to be able to ac access and resolve DNS names for internal services as well. So let's kind of take a look at a diagram here that'll help us to understand what our needs are here. So in your typical Kubernetes cluster, you're going to have your master nodes and your worker nodes. But then within the cluster network itself, so you're going to have a kind of a large CIDR block that defines what your cluster network is. And this is where your pods, your application pods that you deploy out to your Kubernetes cluster, this is the CIDR block where they are going to obtain IP addresses from. So when the Kubernetes scheduler schedules a pod to go run on one of your worker nodes, then the worker node is going to get an IP address from the CIDR block and it'll associate it with each pod within your application that you're deploying. So each of the pods that you deploy get their own separate IP address here. And in order to actually resolve DNS names, these pods that are running your application code are going to need some kind of DNS server to communicate with. Now, theoretically, you could configure them to communicate with a DNS server that's outside of the cluster. You could use uh, maybe a root server out on the internet, like Google's Quad8s or 8844, or even Cloudflare's Quad1s, the 1.1.1.1 DNS server as well. However, if your pods need to resolve internal services inside the cluster as well, then you're going to need an internal DNS server to the cluster. And then if the pods need to resolve anything that's external to the cluster, you can configure your core DNS pods to forward those requests for external DNS names out to some other DNS server. So imagine that you've got you know, a few application pods here, and let's say that these application pods are just running some typical application, maybe a web server or something like that, or maybe it's an API tier. And those web server or API application pods are going to need to communicate with some kind of data store. So that could be maybe object storage, it could be a relational database, it could be a NoSQL database, a graph database, all sorts of different types of backing stores that you could potentially use on a web application. But for the sake of example, let's say that we've just got something simple like a MySQL database. And so you're gonna have this MySQL pod that's out running on your cluster here. And then typically, even if you just have a singular pod, you're also going to want to put that behind what's known as a service controller. You could create a service and give it a name like MySQL DB, for example. I mean, we'll just use all lowercase for that. And so you've got this pod called MySQL, and you're exposing it through a service here. And so in order for these application pods that are running your web application, in order to discover this service called MySQL DB, they are going to need to be able to make an internal DNS request out to the cluster. And that's where core DNS comes into play. So when you create this service controller that forwards traffic over to your standalone MySQL pod, this service controller will actually get an IP address of its own, and it will actually register itself with core DNS. And so core DNS is going to allow the application pods that are connected to your Kubernetes cluster network 
to basically resolve this name MySQL DB. So rather than having to, you know, figure out what the IP address of this MySQL pod is here, and then maybe configure that as an environment variable on all of these pods here, you can simply create the pod, create the service, and then basically just configure all of these application pods to point to this more user-friendly name, which is MySQL DB, instead of having to configure an IP address uh, statically on all of these application pods. And so what's really nice about that is that you have some consistency here. So whenever these application pods request MySQL DB, they're just going to get the IP address that the service has and, rather than the individual pod. And so if for some reason some problem occurred with this MySQL pod over here, so maybe that pod dies and then you replace it with an entirely new MySQL pod that is also configured with the same labels so that the network traffic is forwarded from the service to that pod, well, rather than having to reconfigure all of these application pods with the new IP address of the replacement MySQL pod, your application pods can just continue to run with no configuration changes because they're just going to be looking for this service DNS name here instead of that static IP address. So this is a really good way to set up service-to-service -service communications inside your Kubernetes cluster. Maybe you've got these application pods that are exposed behind a service of their own, right? So let's say that these three pods all belong to part of the same service, and that's like called you know my web api for example and so this service controller here will now be responsible for forwarding traffic to all three of these application pods so now let's say that you have some other application right some kind of um, app two pod because i'm not feeling terribly creative right now but let's say you've got a, a pod named app two and this is some other client application maybe it's a cli tool that you're using interactively with kubectl uh, run or kubectl exec perhaps and let's say that this pod needs to communicate with these application pods over here well you don't want to have to take all three of these pods and discover what their IP addresses are, and then plug those IP addresses into this app2 pod, it's actually a lot easier if we could just tell this app2 pod that it wants to communicate with the service named web API. And so anytime that this application running inside of app2 pod is going to request communication with web API, the service load balancer here internal to the cluster is going to figure out which of these three pods within the application itself it wants to forward traffic to. And what's really nice about this is that if one of these pods were to die off, well, there's still two healthy pods running here. And so app2 pod will be able to continue to operate without any kind of service interruption, because rather than communicating directly with a specific pod that could potentially die, instead, we're pointing it over to the service with a DNS name, and that DNS name will then kind of forward traffic to different pods that are behind that service. So having a functional DNS mechanism internally to your cluster is incredibly important so that you can ensure continuity of network communications between different services in your cluster, whether it's a client application communicating with an API, or whether it's uh, an application or an API that needs to communicate with some kind of database service over here that's also running on the cluster. And of course, I kind of forgot to connect this MySQL pod here to the network, but of course, every pod gets a, an IP address on the network, so that's generally commonly understood. In any case, this is kind of why Core DNS is important. Core DNS is de deployed automatically on most clusters. If you're provisioning using Kube ADM, uh, if you are provisioning using a cloud service like Amazon Elastic Kubernetes Service as well, then they will automatically spin up Core DNS for you as well. And there's lots of other managed Kubernetes services out there from cloud providers like uh, Azure and Google Cloud or Google Kubernetes Engine. There's DigitalOcean, there's Linode, there's Vulture, and a whole bunch of other vendors out there that are starting to offer managed Kubernetes services. And as part of the cluster initialization or setup process, they'll automatically create these core DNS pods for you. So typically what you're going to see happen in a fresh Kubernetes cluster configuration is Connected to your cluster network, there's going to be two different core DNS pods. And these pods in particular 
are going to be typically deployed into the namespace. So let's put namespace and then cube system. And so these core DNS pods, along with the replica set and the deployment controller, are all going to be deployed into this namespace called cube system. And basically, that's going to run DNS for your internal network on your Kubernetes cluster here so that all of your pods are able to make these DNS resolutions between different services as well as making external DNS requests out to other DNS servers out on the internet as well. So if your application pod needs to make a request out to the GitHub REST APIs or maybe out to GitLab or Azure or AWS REST APIs, then the core DNS pods are going to allow the application pods to make those external DNS requests, send them the IP address, and then the pod, the application running in that pod will then make the outbound IP uh, TCP or UDP connection, whatever is appropriate there, in order to connect to that remote service. Now, one other thing that you're going to find in this cube system namespace, let me just kind of move this text down a little bit to make it more readable here. What you're going to see in this cube system namespace is something known as a config map. And the config map is going to basically be responsible for specifying the, uh, the configuration for your core DNS pods. So the core DNS deployment here, this is a deployment controller in Kubernetes, which is a primitive object in the Kubernetes API. And the deployment controller is responsible for basically establishing a certain number of replicas for whatever pod spec that you give it. And the deployment itself doesn't actually create the pods directly, but what it does is it creates dynamically a replica set with kind of a randomized name that's based on the deployment name. And then the replica set itself is going to then be responsible for provisioning the core DNS pods. However, the configuration for these core DNS pods is actually going to come from a resource known as a config map in Kubernetes. And that's basically just kind of a set of key value pairs. It's very similar to a secret resource where you can have a secret key and a secret value. And then you can simply refer to those values inside of your Kubernetes pods. So this config map that gets created for core DNS by default when you provision your Kubernetes cluster is actually going to get attached over to each of your core DNS pods. Forgive the uh, kind of confusing lines here, but this config map will get mounted into these pods here. And then the core DNS pod, when core DNS itself, the actual binary, gets created inside of a container as part of that pod scheduling process, then it's going to read the configuration out of this config map. And so if you wanted to make any changes to your core DNS configuration, then you would do that right here on this config map object. So you don't have to worry about, you know, creating a file on a file system and then mounting that persistent volume into a pod. It's actually a lot more convenient because you can actually just edit this config map resource on your Kubernetes cluster, and then you can make any updates to the core DNS configuration that you want to. And then from there, uh, you can basically redeploy these core DNS pods by using a rollout command on, on the deployment object or the deployment resource. And then once you do a rollout command on the core DNS deployment, it'll go ahead and create a new replica set and it will redeploy the core DNS pods so that they can obtain any changes that you made to this config map resource right here. So in the rest of this skill, what we're going to do is kind of explore this architecture a little bit here and just kind of understand what the cluster looks like when we provision it. We'll take a look at the resources that get created in the kube system namespace here, like the deployment, your replica set, your core DNS pods, your config map. And we'll also take a look at some of the different core DNS plugins just at a high level to help you understand exactly how core DNS works. I hope this has been informative for you, and I'd like to thank you for viewing.